Welcome back to Echo Ridge today. We're going to learn how to ranch some puffs. In our test map here, we have a completed puff ranch, dense puff ranch, and squeaky puff ranch. And they are all 100% automated. Now I've heard some feedback that some people like to use the term automated as in it requires no dupe interaction. I'm using the word automated here as it requires no player interaction. Primarily because we are raising domesticated puffs, which means they have to be groomed. And until you figure out how to get Rover to do some critter grooming, dupes are gonna have to do that task no matter what. But the reason why I say 100% automated, puffs are notoriously difficult to ranch domestically. And that all has to do with the requirement of the Puff Prince, but we'll get there in a minute. For the usual reminder, if you are a very new player and are still generally unfamiliar with ranching in general, I have an ultimate hatch tutorial that I would highly recommend you watching first. It'll go over a lot more of the basics on critter ranching, and as such, all the other critter tutorials I have sort of assume that everybody has the same baseline info on what an incubator is, why we groom critters, etc, etc. That reminds me, why do people say etc, etc? Isn't one etc enough? As the usual, we're going to start off in our database and go over the very basics of the puffs themselves. The puff is an actual species of a group of critters, and it just so happens that one of that group of critters is named a puff. All of the puffs breathe in gas and then excrete some sort of solid. In the puffed case, they breathe in polluted oxygen and excrete slime. When they expire, they drop 1600 calories of meat, which is similar to a pip. So your standard hatch math will not work because remember hatches drop 3200 kilos worth of meat. As far as the amounts, a puff will breathe in 50 kilos worth of polluted oxygen and excrete 47 and a half kilos worth of slime. The squeaky puff breathes in chlorine and excretes bleachstone. They do it at a slightly different rate of 30 kilos of chlorine to 28.5 kilos of bleachstone. And then we have the dense puff that breathes in oxygen and excretes oxalite. And they do it at the same rate as a standard puff at 50 kilos of gas to 47 and a half kilos worth of the solid, in this case, oxalite. And then finally, we have the puff prints. The puff prints is sort of a unique critter in the fact that their presence impacts the reproduction of other critters. And that's something unique in oxygen not included. Now the ratio of their gas to solid production is not good at all. They breathe in 30 kilos of each gas and only excrete three kilos. And then finally, the comfort and livable range for all the puffs are somewhat similar. They all have a wide band with the standard puff livable range from minus 30 to 105, the puff prints from minus 60 to 115, the squeaky puff from minus 60 to 85, and then the dense puff at minus 15 to 115. Now, as you can see, I only have six critters in each ranch. And the reason why is because puffs like their space. Each critter requires 16 tiles worth of space. 16 divided by 96 is six. Now there's two different sets of numbers that we need to remember as far as production rates. First, we'll go over the dense puff and the standard puff because they're both similar in the fact that they consume 50 kilos worth of gas and excrete 95% of it. Now because the dense puffs consume 50 kilos worth of oxygen, we have five dense puffs in here, so they're gonna be consuming 250 kilos of oxygen per cycle. The puff prints only consumes 30. So our total requirement of oxygen needed per cycle to run this ranch is 280 kilos. But for that oxygen, we're gonna be given 240.5 kilos worth of oxalite per cycle, with 237 and a half coming from the dense puffs and then an extra three kilos coming from the puff prints. They normally breathe in the gas somewhat lower in the ranch and then rise up to the top of the ranch to excrete. Now this doesn't happen all the time, it's just a typical behavior. But considering puffs are some of the buggiest critters in oxygen not included, I wouldn't count very much on that quote, typical behavior. The production math is the same on the standard puff ranch. They'll breathe in 280 kilos worth of polluted oxygen and excrete 240.5 kilos worth of slime per cycle. The puff prince doesn't care what environment they're in. They'll breathe any type of the gas. Now the squeaky puffs are a little bit different because remember they only consume 30 kilos worth of chlorine per cycle. So you will only need 180 kilos worth of chlorine per cycle to keep these puffs nice and fed. And in return, you're gonna receive 145.5 kilos worth of bleachstone per cycle, with each squeaky puff excreting 28.5 kilos 
And then our puff prints with the paltry three kilos. Next, let's go over everybody's favorite subject, and that's how much barbecue can you get out of each ranch? We'll also take a look at the omelets. Some important things we need to know though. A happy and groomed puff will lay an egg once every 4.54 cycles due to their reproduction rate of 22% per cycle. And puffs live for 75 cycles, which means they're an adult for 70 cycles. So if you take 70 and divide it by 4.54, you're going to be given a number of 15.4, which means every puff is going to lay 15.4 eggs in the course of their lifetime. Well, if we take all the adorable little puffs and put them inside of an evolution chamber so they naturally evolve into meat, if we know that each of the 15.4 eggs is going to evolve into 1600 calories worth of meat, we know it's going to take two of them each time to make 4,000 calories worth of barbecue. Or we can say that each one is worth 2,000 calories worth of barbecue. So we can just take the 15.4 and multiply it times 2,000 gives us 30,800 calories worth of barbecue. We divide that by the 70 cycles that we're getting those eggs for, and we have 440 calories per cycle per puff. Multiplying that times six, we get a total of 2,640 per cycle. So the long and short of it is, each ranch will keep 2.6 dupes fed. And just in case you don't like the evolving of the critters, let's go ahead and check out our omelet math. Saturday Echo here is cracking open a Puff Prince egg, and what we're given is is a raw egg that weighs 250 grams. This is somewhat of an issue because not all eggs are the same size. For instance, let me grab one of the hatchling eggs. Now before Sunday Echo gets done cracking this, remember that was 250 grams. Now that we've cracked the hatchling egg, you can see we have 1250 grams, which means the hatch raw egg was one kilo, whereas the puffed raw egg was only 250 grams. So what does this mean for us in our omelet production? Well, it requires one kilo worth of raw egg to make one omelet or in our case, four puffed eggs. If we can take the 15.4 eggs we know we're gonna get from each puff, divide that by four, and you can see we're gonna get 3.85 omelets every 70 cycles. And knowing that each omelet is 2,800 calories, we can multiply the 2,800 calories times the 3.85 omelets that we're gonna be able to get, and we get 10,780 calories per puff. But now, of course, we want that in a per cycle rate, so we're gonna divide that by 70, and we're given 150 four calories per cycle. Multiply that times six puffs per ranch and you get 924 calories, which means if you're turning all these puff eggs into omelets, you won't even have enough omelets to feed one dupe per cycle. Although two ranches would be enough to feed 1.8 dupes. All right, Echo, that's all well and good. Now get us to the good stuff. How do we build a ranch? And we're gonna go over this in a sort of step-by-step -step fashion for the simple reason that this is probably the most complicated ranch that you'll ever need to build, thanks to the wonderful puff prints. But because of that, I wanna make sure we go over each portion nice and slow so this tutorial does what it's supposed to do. We have a nice big area here and we're going to be making a puff ranch as we go over this. First, some other details. As you can see on the reproductions of this dense puff, there's different percentage chances on what kind of egg it's going to lay. In a dense puffed ranch, we want it to lay more dense puffs. And as long as it's pinned with a puffed prince, the chances of it laying a dense pufflet egg will continue to increase. If it's not pinned with a pufflet prince, the chance of it laying a pufflet prince egg will increase. In fact, if they go long enough without a puff prince, they will only produce pufflet prince eggs. And likewise, if they're in the branch for long enough with a puff prince, their chance of laying a puff prince egg will reduce down to zero. Here, we have a puff prince that's been in this ranch for about 38 cycles. And you can see the squeaky puff has a 70% chance to lay another squeaky puffed egg, a 0% chance of laying a pufflet prince egg, and a 30% chance of laying a pufflet egg. And it looks similar over in our standard puff ranch. This puff prince is 19 cycles old, which means it's been in here for about 19 cycles. And this 10 cycle old puff has a 0% chance of laying any pufflet prince eggs, but an equal chance of laying either dense, squeaky, or regular puffed egg. But this six cycle old puff only has a 6% chance to lay a squeaky or a dense pufflet egg, and an 87% chance to lay a standard puffed egg. And these sort of percentages are very important because a lot of times on a map, you're gonna start with a standard puff with the goal of probably getting to a squeaky pufflet or a dense pufflet eggs. And you have a couple of options. You can just wait until they naturally lay one of those eggs in the wild, or you can set up a ranch and start churning through some eggs. 
Well, first let's look at our frame. This box is 12 by eight tiles interior. And I like this size for our vertical wrenches because one auto sweeper can cover the entire thing and it still adds up to being a 96 tile ranch. In our example, we're gonna be building a dense puff ranch for the simple reason, it's just a little easier. Because it's oxygen, it's not gonna require a liquid lock and the dense puff is pretty great because it gives you some of that beautiful, beautiful oxalite. Here we have our basic box and as you can see, it is 96 tiles in size. So when we add our grooming station, it'll become a stable. Now in our dense puff ranch itself, we're going to want a thin layer of water. That way, when the dense puffs lay their oxalite, the oxalite will not off gas. And here we go. It's our basic stable. Now, because I already have a dense puff ranch, it's going to be a little bit easier to start this thing off. But let's go over some of the tips that you're going to have to do if you're building this from scratch on your colony. Puffs can't be wrangled like other critters, with one minor exception. In fact, you have to use one of these airborne critter baits and sort of lure them in the direction you want them to go. Now, when you're using these baits, the material that you put down is very important. Oxalite for attracting dense puffs, slime for attracting regular puffs, and bleachstone for attracting squeaky puffs. The other materials are typically used for attracting shine bugs. The other method is using the auto wrangle surplus trick. For instance, if I say there's only supposed to be four critters in here and then click auto wrangle surplus, the duplicate's gonna come by and automatically wrangle one of these puffs that you can then move around. Here comes Wednesday Echo now, and it's going to do just that. And then of course, you can take this wonderful puff after it's been wrangled and move it just like you would any other critter. But as easy as that is, I say there's one easier. And that's by just using an incubator and grabbing an egg that has been laid in the wild. Now in this specific ranch, we're actually gonna start with a pufflet prince inside this stable. And the reason why we do that is we want the pufflet prince to be in this ranch. So by the time we start dropping off dense puffs, their chances of laying a pufflet prince egg are zero. So to do that, we need to get a pufflet prince in here. Additionally, when you're looking at the reproduction, notice it says puffed prince, not a pufflet prince. In other words, the puff prince has to be an adult for the other puffs to recognize that it is penned with the appropriate critter. Now here we have two incubation rooms and these are gonna be important because remember, we're not only gonna have to make sure that we keep dense puffs in this ranch, but we're also gonna need to make sure that there's pufflet princes. And how we get about automatically doing that and making sure that there's only one puff prince in this stable is where it starts to get a little complicated. But take note, if you didn't mind manually setting these things up and manually making sure that one puff prints and five other puffs in this ranch, you can be done right here. But this is where I say it's a little separate from being 100% automated versus the player manually having to make sure the correct amount of pufflet princes are inside the stable. And to start off, we're just gonna say pufflet prints and puff prints. Now to start with the automation. And like I said before, we're gonna go over it nice and slow because it can get complicated. There are three different interconnected automation systems in play to get this ranch going. The first is automation that's gonna control the locking and unlocking of doors. The second is a shipping and automation system that is counting and tracking the amount of puff princes in that ranch. And the third is a timer system. The timer is important because it's counting how long that puff prince has been in the ranch. Let's start with the pufflet prince automation here. There is a gritter sensor, and once it detects either an egg or a critter, it's gonna start sending out a green signal because it's set on above zero. So whenever there's one or more, it's gonna send out a green signal. Once it does, it's gonna unlock this door. The reason why we're doing that is because the egg is gonna be delivered by this conveyor chute. Once the door's unlocked, a dupe can come by, scoop up the egg, put it in the incubator, or if you wanted to get a little sexy, you could use an auto sweeper. And the auto sweeper will end up loading the egg inside the incubator. Either way, the door needs to be unlocked. That way the duplicate can come lullaby the egg and grab it when it's hatched. Incidentally, when this door becomes green, this door becomes red and locks. The reason why is because this ranch has five standard puffs and one puff prince. Once this puff prince dies, there's a chance there would be a puffed ready and the duplicates would come in here, grab it, and then drop it off. Well, we don't want that to happen because then there'd be six puffs sitting in this ranch. So we lock the door to make sure the duplicate can't go in here to grab the critter. Incidentally, it's also the reason why we have a couple of pneumatic doors in here. Because if this door locks while the puff prince is incubating, after a few cycles, the pufflet will let itself out of the incubator and then would start flying around. 
we don't want it to leave. Now you've probably noticed that each of these incubator rooms have another door. Well, they're escape doors. While these doors are locking, we don't want a duplicate to be stuck in here with no way to get out. So we have doors here that are set on one way only, so if the room does happen to get locked, the duplicate can come through here to escape. You'll also note that this one is made out of a mechanized airlock. You could also make it out of a manual airlock. The reason we have this is that way a duplicate can't come over here with a pufflet prince egg and load it into the incubator. And if it was a pneumatic door, they would be able to do that right through it. It's also the reason why this is a pneumatic door. That way, if this incubator is empty when this room is locked, the duplicate can still load the incubator. The last little bit of math that we need to go over to since we're talking about the incubator rooms is why we have this incubator powered, but not this one. Puffs live for 75 cycles, and an unpowered incubator has a change per cycle rate of 7%. So it's going to take this egg 14.2 total cycles in order to hatch. If we take 75 cycles, which is the lifespan of our puff, and divide it by 14.2, we can see that this incubator is going to give us 5.2 puffs in 75 cycles, which is great because we only need five puffs to be replaced in 75 cycles. When the egg is being powered, that puff is only going to take three cycles, which is important because the longer we go without a puff prince in this ranch, the likelihood of them laying nothing but pufflet princes goes up, which would then end up hurting our production of either slime, bleach stone, or oxalite, but then that's where the next stage in our system works. Right now, these puffs have a 0% chance of laying a pufflet prince egg, but once this pufflet prince dies, the chances of them laying one are going to get higher and higher. And when they do finally lay a pufflet prince egg, that's where a shipping part of our system comes into play. The rail comes down through here and then heads into a solid filter. This solid filter is looking to filter out nothing but pufflet prince eggs. If it does, it's going to hit this conveyor shutoff and then pass through this conveyor meter. Once this conveyor meter detects a pufflet prince egg, it's going to start sending out a green signal. The green signal is going to hit a NOT gate, and then that NOT gate is going to turn into a red signal, which is then going to turn this conveyor shutoff off. So any future pufflet prince eggs are going to hit the conveyor shutoff and be bypassed, where they hit this bridge and then continue on to the evolution chamber. And this is an important system because we only want one egg to be dropped off. Afterwards, all the additional pufflet prince eggs are going to end up here. This is the one pufflet prince to rule them all. The last part of our automation ties in with the first, and that's the timer. Once that egg is dropped off and this critter sensor starts sending out a green signal, the green signal comes down through here and then goes into the reset counters of the signal counters. And once it gets that green signal, it resets both counters. Now, if you've never seen the way these work, whenever their input receives a green signal, the counter will increase by one. We can also set them so that their output sends a green signal once a number has been matched. In this case, it's 10. And that is how we are able to count by tens or even count by one hundreds. Once this gets to nine and receives another count, it'll go to zero and send out a green signal, which will then increase this one. And then it would say one zero. Now, if you were to automate these up like this, it would look kind of squirrely. For instance, it would receive a signal to make it go up, and then you'd have to do some weird stuff like this, and then once again go out, and then all the counters would be working sort of correctly. But there's an easier way, because your signal counters can be flipped. Now, all I have to do is bring in my green signal here, and then whenever it hits its magic number, it'll send it over, and vice versa. These are all correctly wired up to count now. In this case, we have the first one set on 10, and the second one set on 7, because we're counting up to 70 cycles. Once the counter hits 70, it's going to send out a green signal, which is then going to reset the conveyor meter. Right now, you can see the conveyor meters hit its max amount of one unit. Well, once it's reset, it'll say zero, and it'll be waiting for the one unit, which of course brings us full circle, because by that time, we're going to be starting to look for pufflet prince eggs, and because the conveyor meter was set to zero, the conveyor shutoff will no longer be disabled, so any pufflet prince egg will be allowed to go across the conveyor shutoff to where it'll be dropped off in this incubation room, which will then trigger the maximum amount on the conveyor meter, once again sending out a signal that turns the conveyor shutoff off. So the entire time that a pufflet prince is in this room, 
Whether or not it's in egg form or as a critter waiting to be dropped off at the ranch, the automation signal is going to be green, which is going to hold the signal counters to zero. It's not until this critter sensor starts sending off a red signal after the dupe grabs the egg and drops it off that this signal counter is going to start ticking up. And in this case, we have it ticking up once per cycle. We have a timer sensor here set at one for green and 599 at red because there are 600 total seconds in a cycle and we want this counter to increase by one every single cycle. Our Pufflet Prince Egg is almost done incubating, so let's get the automation in. We can start off with the rails. All the eggs come out and they go into the solid filter. And if it's not a Pufflet Prince Egg, it's gonna make its way all the way to the evolution chamber. If it is a Pufflet Prince Egg, which we will set on the solid filter now so we don't forget later, it's gonna go through this enabled conveyor shutoff into a conveyor meter and then up into our incubation room, which is now where we're gonna start with our critter sensor. We want it to detect if there's anything in here. If there is, it's gonna unlock this door and then lock this door. Incidentally, we need that signal to come down here for a timer. We have the first signal counter, then we'll flip the second one and then bring these in and connect them right to the reset counters. Now, these will be frozen at zero until once again, there is no Pufflet Prince Egg. We also need the mechanism that allows it to tick up. And in this case, this is the timer sensor. We're gonna set it on one green, 599 red, so that it sends out a green signal once per cycle right into this counter. We wire up both counters. And now, basically, we have a working clock. And then we need to connect our timer to the reset portion of our conveyor meter. We also need to make sure the conveyor meter is gonna turn off the conveyor shutoff when the time is appropriate. So we will limit the meter to one unit, tie in a knot gate, and then finish it off by connecting it to the conveyor shutoff. The last step should just be powering all three of these shipping components. The last thing to do with the shipping rails is we need to add a bridge and a connection for the overflow from the conveyor shutoff. Because remember, after one puff egg, this conveyor shutoff turns off so we need to send the rest of the Pufflet Prince eggs to the evolution chamber. You might be tempted to do something like this, but the problem with that would be the eggs would come out of here and see this input and start going back and forth this way. So instead, we just bridge all the remaining eggs on. Something like this. And that's really it. We'll go ahead and select dense pufflets for our other incubator, and duplicates will come and drop these off. Now, because I'm running two dense puff ranches, there's some rare oddities that could happen. For instance, they could grab a dense pufflet egg from this incubator and drop it off in this ranch, which you think to yourself is not too big of a deal. But likewise, because there wasn't enough dense puffs in this ranch, they took our new pufflet prince egg and put it inside this ranch. And that's why for this system, I recommend either physically separating the ranches to where one incubator can't be accessed into the other, or just running one of the ranches altogether. Because occasionally, some weird things would happen just like this. But like I said, this is not a problem you have to run into unless you're running multiple of these and they sort of get out of sync. Another problem that can happen is let's say the Pufflin Prince in this ranch dies. Then there's five dense puffs and no Puff Prince yet. And since this critter drop off is set on six, they could grab a dunce puff from this incubator way up here, drop it off in this ranch, and then all of a sudden, you're sitting at six dense puffs without a pufflet prince. There's a couple of optional features that you can set up in these systems. The first is by using two critter drop-offs. By having two critter drop-offs, you could say we only want five dense puffs in each ranch. This critter drop-off says six, with the sixth obviously being the puffed prince. But this can also end up causing you problems, but only in the case when you're running multiple ranches. When there's only four dense puffs in here, they could then grab somebody else's puff prince and then drop it off. And then there'd be two puff princes in here. But once again, this is only an issue if you're running two stables. Some other notes on the ranches themselves. You can see here with the standard puff ranch, we have it liquid locked. For the simple reason, there's a lot of polluted oxygen. You might be inclined to put a thin layer of polluted water to continuously off gas. If that is your only method, it will work, although the puffs will occasionally get hungry because the polluted water will not be off-gassing quick enough. You can get creative with this problem though, for instance, extending the area a little bit to where there's more room for the polluted water to off-gas. And in that case, there should be plenty of polluted oxygen for the wonderful puffs to breathe. Some other options is you could just pump in the polluted oxygen from either a polluted oxygen geyser or maybe even just using some sublimation stations and getting rid of a lot of that extra polluted dirt. 
Plenty of ways to skin that pip, these are just a couple. The squeaky puffs are similar. Once again, it's liquid locked because it's nothing but chlorine, and we just pipe in all the chlorine from a chlorine gas vent. Incidentally, you could just build one of these stables around a chlorine gas vent. And on both the slime and the bleach stone, there's no reason to put in a thin layer of water because, well, we don't mind it off-gassing. It'll off-gas for a little bit until it gets above, I believe, 1800 grams, and then the bleach stone will no longer be able to off-gas. So it's a perfect little storage area for both your bleach stone, your oxalite, and your slime. Now, because I want you to see this whole system in action, we're going to sort of reset this system. And all we really need to do to do that is make sure the conveyor meter was reset to zero units. So now, whenever a pufflet prince egg passes through here, it'll know to be able to accept it. To start the process off, we're going to arbitrarily kill this puff prince and say thank you for your contributions to the stable. Less than seconds later, the chances of them laying a pufflet prince egg starts to climb. Let me fast forward a little bit, and I'll give you an update here in a few. This is also a good time to show you why having two critter drop-offs can be beneficial. Because this critter drop-off is set to 5, and puffs, even if this pufflet egg, which will take over 14 cycles to hatch, were to hatch before we get a pufflet prince in here, they will not drop it off. Because according to the dupes, there can only be 5 puffs in here. But there can be 6 critters if the 6th is a puffed prince. It's been about a cycle later, and we're going to be paying attention to this puff specifically, because they're the closest to being able to lay an egg. In this case, in just one cycle, their chances of laying a pufflet prince egg went up to 14%. Alright, Petunia here is at a reproduction of 99%, and it's been about another cycle, and you can see that their chances of laying a pufflet prince egg are up to 26%. So it may not happen with Petunia here, and we may have to wait for the next puff to lay an egg, but we'll see in just a moment. And here it is, Petunia has just finished laying their egg and in this case it is a squeaky pufflet egg so our wait continues next up is pauline the puff pauline is at 99 percent and they currently have a 27 percent chance well pauline also laid a squeaky pufflet egg maybe our luck will be better with petra the third puff and there it is thank you petra there's our wonderful pufflet prince egg and now we can follow it as it makes its way through our automation system comes out of the conveyor loader heads up to the solid filter where its upc is scanned heads through the conveyor shutoff and then past the conveyor meter note the conveyor meter now has one unit that passed it so it's reached its limit so it's sending on a green signal which a knot gate flips and then turns off the conveyor shutoff and because all of these puffs still don't have a puff prince they're going to start laying more and more pufflet prince eggs but it doesn't matter because this conveyor shutoff is disabled, all the rest of the pufflet prince eggs are going to go to the evolution chamber. Our pufflet prince egg is heading towards incubation center. Notice right now the signal counter says 24 and then is just reset. Because the critter sensor detected an egg, this door is now locked, this one is unlocked, and our egg can be lullabied. In about three cycles, that pufflet prince will be hatched and then it'll be dropped off to our ranch here. Until then, notice this door is locked. That way, you can't get in there and grab this pufflet egg if it so happens to hatch. It will because it's at a 95% incubation. Also notice while the egg is in here, the green signal is still being sent, which is keeping this counter set up zeros. And as predicted, here's our happy little guy waiting to go to its future ranch. And unfortunately, this door is locked, so no one can get in here anyways. So Echo, if we're using two different critter drop-offs to make sure that there's only one puff prince, why do we also lock this door? And truth be told, you don't have to lock the door. You could remove all the automation from here if you're using the two critter drop-offs. If you weren't using the two critter drop-offs, you would definitely need the door locked in here because otherwise this critter would be delivered here and then we'd have six puffs in the ranch but i'm still introducing you to both methods because it's going to depend on what your setup is are you running multiple ranches are you running multiple puff ranches each of these little interconnected systems may be handy in that case our pufflet prince egg is just about done incubating and there we go here comes Sunday Echo now to apparently grab the eggshell because they didn't want to touch the disgusting puff. Wednesday Echo grabbed the puff, which then locks this door and unlocks this one. So we have access to the puffs again. And here's our puff prints being dropped off to their new home. Now all these puffs are going to continue to lay pufflet prince eggs for about the next five cycles until this pufflet prince grows up and becomes a puff prince. But it doesn't really matter because our conveyor meter already has its puff prince and it'll stay that way 
for another 70 cycles. And then once cycle 70 hits, the whole system resets itself and will start looking for another Puff Prince egg. Now I'm going over this in my head, trying to make sure that I've covered everything in AE2, but as usual, there are so many ways to do things, in Oxygen not included. But on puffed ranching specifically, I had been working on a as simple as possible ranch for a very long time, so I hope you've enjoyed a look at it. But I am looking forward to reading your recommendations and to see what you thought. So until next time, happy gaming, and I'll talk to you soon. Thank you.